All right, uh, let's get started. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Uh, so, uh, for Colloquium today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, Ching Chi Yang, who's visiting us today, uh, tomorrow, and Friday morning. Uh, if there's still availabilities on our schedule, if you'd like to sign up uh, for tomorrow and Friday morning, uh, so I encourage you to, to do so. Uh, Ching Chi uh, was an undergraduate uh, at Fudan uh, University in Shanghai. Uh, before uh, coming to NYU, uh, where she did her uh, PhD uh, with Anthony Pullen that, uh, and this ended in 2021, just a year and a half ago. Uh, and since then, went to Carnegie, where she's now a CTAC fellow, one of the theory postdoc uh, uh, fellowships that they have there. Uh, and she's worked, despite being uh, fairly junior, on a remarkably broad range of topics including a couple that I hadn't even realized she worked on until we were talking this morning, including uh, galaxy formation and evolution, the high redshift universe and reionization, uh, the interstellar medium, uh, line emission, uh, dark matter, and the structure of galaxies and self-interacting and other dark sector theories, uh, line intensity mapping surveys, and large-scale structure of the universe. Uh, and from a sort of methodological point of view, uh, on sort of data-driven astrophysics and the interface between uh, astrophysics theory and observations. So look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us more about today. Thank you. Thanks, Philip, for this very nice introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you in person. Today, I want to give a brief introduction about a series of interstellar medium line emission models that we develop to better probe the galaxy physics. So this is the outline of my talk today. I will start with introducing an analytic O3 model that has been applied for current ALMA high redshift O3 measurement. Following that, I will switch focus to a new technique referred as line intensity mapping, which will uniquely complement uh, the galaxy survey that are uh, biased to the brightest line emitters. Specifically, I will introduce the C2, CO, uh, physically motivated C2, CO, and the C1 line models developed by our group and uh, explain their applications for line intensity mapping survey forecast as well as mock data preparation. And uh, finally, I would like to spend some time to introduce my future research plan where I want to uh, extend the existing ISM line emission models to more lines targeted by JWST and Spherix. S sorry. So before the, uh, my talk, uh, to start my talk today, I would like to briefly introduce the notation that will be used throughout the talk. Specifically, I will use a chemical element followed by a number to refer the particle with the number minus one positive charge. So for example, O3 here means oxygen with two positive charge. That's doubly ionized oxygen ion. So similarly, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I only have one C type. Yeah, I only have one C type connector, so yeah, maybe I will just keep moving this. No. Yeah, I will just keep moving the mouse. Yeah, sorry about this. So similarly, the C2 symbol here means singly ionized carbon, and the C1 is the neutral carbon. Then I will use a square bracket to enclose, uh, to enclose this symbol, referring the lines emitted by the corresponding particle. So it, for example, the bracketed O3 symbol means fine structure lines emitted by the doubly ionized oxygen ion. So in a widely accepted picture uh, of, for the evolution of our universe, uh, the universe was filled with very hot and fully ionized gas before its age of about 400,000 years. As the universe keeps expanding and the gas temperature gradually cools down, when the gas temperature reaches about 3,000 Kelvin, the proton and the free electron start to recombine and form neutral hydrogen. And the 
it is at this instance that our universe suddenly become transparent for the long wavelength radiation. And this is why we can measure the cosmic microwave background from the Earth. So after the recombination, the overdense region in our universe uh, keeps tracking matter through gravitational interaction. And at some point, the overdense region will gravitationally collapse and trigger nuclear fusion. This is how the first galaxies and the stars form. After being formed, the first stars will first ionize its nearby gas, and the ionized gas bubble keeps expanding until they fill out the entire uh, uh, space. So the transitional process of our universe from its fully neutral to fully ionized status is highlighted by this yellow arrow, and this time is also referred as epoch of ionization. Measuring and understanding the nature of first galaxies and stars formed during the epoch of, of ionization is very important for us to uh, learn how galaxies form and evolved from the very early time to what we see today. So there are many uh, observables that we can use to probe the nature of high redshift galaxies. Among them, the fine structure lines emitted by the gas within the galaxies, also referred as interstellar medium, are very sensitive to many gas properties, including the density, metallicity, temperature, kinematics, and the star formation activities. To better illustrate this, let's consider a pretty simple picture where we have a clump of molecular cloud shown by this blue region. And this molecular cloud uh, gravitationally collapse and form a stellar population shown at the center. After being formed, the star will radiate photon according to uh, some spectral energy distribution. And the photon with energy higher than 13.6 eV will be mostly used for hydrogen ionization. So this part of the, of the spectrum will create an ionized gas bubble highlighted in the red area. And this phase is also called as, uh, referred as H2 region. After all the hydrogen ionization photons are used up, photon with energy between 6 and 13.6 eV can still disentangle uh, molecular hydrogen. So this part of the spectrum will create a neutral ISM phase highlighted in yellow. And uh, this uh, phase is also referred as H1 region or photodissociated region. So in this very simple picture, I want to highlight several very strong tra uh, tracers for high redshift galaxies. The O3 line here, uh, on, that only comes from the H2 region, is strong tracer for the gas properties in the ion, ionized ISM uh, phase. The C2 line that comes uh, simultaneously from the H2 and the H1 region is observed to be the brightest far infrared line at least in the uh, low and the intermediate redshift uh, universe. The CO and the C1 lines that come mostly from the neutral ISM phase are thought as tracers for the molecular hydrogen mass, which source the star formation activities. So the main point of my talk today is to develop physically motivated or first principle models for those lines so that we can better probe the nature of high very distant galaxies. Uh, so I want to start with the O3 line. As we have mentioned before, the C2158 micron line is observed to be the brightest line at least in the local universe. So it's natural for people to pursue this line at higher redshift. Although uh, the astronomers managed to do uh, multiple follow-up C2 line measurement with ALMA, the detection successful rate is pretty low. And the C2 luminosity versus star formation rate ratio uh, at redshift higher than six seems to be somehow much weaker than the local measurement. But luckily, the O388 micron line is predicted to be detectable by ALMA, and it was firstly detected in 2019 from a high redshift galaxy named NB1006. The O3 signal for this galaxy are highlighted by the white contours in the second figure. So after this uh, discovery, 
uh, today, Alma has already successfully resolved tens of galaxies in their 0388 micron line. And uh, in the third figure, I show the O3 versus C2 line luminosity ratio for those high redshift galaxies highlighted, uh, marked in the red crosses. And those are compared with local uh, measurements shown in the gray scatters. We can see from this figure that uh, at a redshift of zero, the O3 line tends to be, oh. Yeah, sorry about this. Mm -hmm. uh. Okay, we are back online. So at a redshift around zero, we see that the O3 line tend to be comparable or mostly 10 times fainter than the C2 line. However, this situation is completely reversed at high redshift, and this observational result is also referred as the high redshift C2 deficit puzzle. So due to this uh, observational result, Right. So it's not the deficit of C2, it's more that there's been alter H2 regions at this high redshift. And therefore that C2 remains the same. It's the region they excited everywhere. No, and maybe the K2 has a lot corresponding to it. And it does spend that Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point. So you mean that maybe at among those high redshift galaxies, their H2 temperatures are higher? Yeah. That's but, but the O388 micron line is not very temperature sensitive, right? Oh, no, no, you, you have to get O3 in the first place. Uh, That's the hard part, not the... Right, I mean, the H2 region temperature is always like about 10,000 Kelvin. No, so uh, H2 region for the range from 5,000. Right. And the H3 is high to about 12,000 next low. Yes, so uh, it's like the O3. Yeah, I think this is okay, still... Right. In, yeah, this is interesting. We should <laughs> look this back. So, so maybe I didn't completely follow th the discussion here. So I think if the temperature for H2 region is higher uh, at high redshift, I understand that the O3 optical line will be brighter, but not for the O388 micron line. Also, then why the C2 line is seems to be. I see. Yeah, yeah, we should go back to this. This is very interesting. So anyway, due to this uh, observational result, the O388 micron line is now one of the most important high redshift galaxy tracers. Moreover, the, uh, during its very first year of operation, the James Webb telescope has already successfully resolved 133 O3 optical emitters at redshift between five and seven. It also resolved the O3 optical signal for nine emitters at a redshift higher than seven. And those observational results already start to pin down the stellar mass versus metallicity relation at high redshift as highlighted by this uh, red curve. So I have a question, why are we from N2 to one micron? Are there no high redshift all no observation? The N2 line? Mm -hmm. I think, I think they are, this should be covered by the observational frequency band. It's just that the line is not bright enough, so you can resolve them. Yeah, I think, I think, for example, in the previous uh, plot given by Henrik in 2019, uh, besides trying to resolve the C2 uh, and the O3 lines, they also try to measure the N2 line, but it's all non-detections.
Okay. So more, uh, moreover, the spherics line intensity mapping survey will measure the integrated O3 emission over wide redshift range, including the end of epoch of ionization. So motivated by all those current and the upcoming ALMA JWST measurement, as well as the line prospect of line intensity mapping measurement, we developed a, an, a, an analytic O3 emission line model to better interpret the current and the upcoming O3 detections. So in this plot, I show the fine uh, atomic structure for O3 ion on its ground electron configuration. So there are in total five fine structure energy states. Uh, the 88 and the 52 micron line that are covered by the ALMA frequency channels uh, are emitted when the ion transit from level one to the ground state and the level two to one. The three optical lines that are covered by the JWST frequency window are emitted when the ion goes from level three to one, three to two, and the four to three. So although we know that the gas property distribution throughout the galaxy is highly non-uniform and the, the Galaxy geometry can be pretty complex and even show multi-component structure. But in this work for simplicity, we will assume a uniform H2 region environment. And this assumption is also referred as the one zone model. Um, although this is obviously an oversimplified assumption, but the one zone assumption is actually widely adopted for observational interpretation. So the physical physics meaning for the ISM parameters that are used to characterize the one zone environment is still unclear, but roughly speaking, it will be some roughly luminosity weighted gas properties averaged throughout the galaxy. So under this uniform gas environment assumption, we can linearly sum up, uh, we can combine all the hydrogen ionization sources distributed throughout the galaxy into a superstar showing in the center. And this super radiation source will create a big giant, uh, will create one H2 region enclosed by the blue circle. So we can do this because the volume of individual H2 regions created by different uh, stellar population is proportional to their hydrogen ionization photon generation rate, QH1. So we can linearly sum up uh, the discrete H2 spheres um, to get this one giant H2 region with volume determined by the total QH1 of this galaxy. Then the O3 line luminosity for this spherically symmetric and the uniform galaxy can be modeled by product of those four terms. The H new term highlighted in red is the energy for O3 line photon. The A term marked in orange is the rate that the O3 ion can spontaneously decay from an upper to lower fine structure energy level. The N term is the number density of O3 ion on the higher fi uh, fine structure energy state. Finally, the VO3 is the vo total volume of O3 region. So among those four terms, the energy for O3 photon and the spontaneous decay rates are known physical parameters. So we only need to solve for the O3 ion uh, po uh, level population abundance and the volume of the total O3 region. To solve for the N term, we can, uh, we can derive it through the level population balance equation where we assume that the abundance of O3 ion on all the fine structure energy states doesn't vary with time. And in this step, by definition, the abundance of O3 ion will be proportional to the gas phase metallicity. Then we can assume the, uh, approximate the volume of O3 region by the H2 region volume. And as we have discussed before, the volume of H2 region is proportional to the QH1 of this galaxy. So we compare uh, our mod model prediction with spectral synthesis cl uh, code cloudy over wide ISM parameter space, and uh, we find excellent agreement. Here, as two examples, I show the 88 micron line luminosity and the 52 micron line luminosity versus QH1 under ver uh, various 
uh, H2 region gas density. Uh, so the cloudy simulation results are given by the solid curves, while our model predictions are given by the dashed lines. So we see that they basically overlap with each other. Another thing to notice here is that the 88 micron line luminosity only start to decrease significantly when the gas density gets higher than 100 per centimeter cube uh, marked in the green curve, while for the 52 micron line, um, the luminosity decrease at a higher gas density when the gas density gets higher than 1,000 per centimeter cube. So this difference only reflects the fact that the critical density between those two lines are different. Uh, specifically speaking, the, there are uh, two main ways that the ion can decay from an upper to lower fine structure energy state. The first way is through spontaneous decay during which one O3 photon will be emitted. And then another way is, another approach is to scatter inelastically with electron and to go through collisional de-excitation. But during this process, no photon will be emitted. The critical density is defined as the gas density, where the spontaneous decay rate and the collisional de-excitation rate gets identical. So the fact that the 52 micron line luminosity only start to drop at a higher uh, gas density reflects the fact that the 52 micron line shows a higher critical density than the 88 micron line. So uh, comparing our model with spectral synthesis code such as Cloudy, the strength is its high computational efficiency. So we can use it to explore the continuous ISM parameter space. Um, so given the 88 micron line luminosity versus star formation rate measured by ALMA for nine high redshift galaxies that are available in 1990, we can use our model to constrain their gas density and the metallicity. So here, since we are trying to constrain two free parameters with a single observable, we see this L-shaped degeneracy in the 2D parameter space. But nevertheless, we are still able to constrain a lower bound of metallicity and then upper bound of gas density for all those nine ALMA targets. One important application for the metallicity constraint is to study the redshift evolution of this stellar mass versus metallicity relation. So in this figure, I show the mass metallicity redshift evolution predicted by fire simulation uh, from redshift to zero to six. And uh, this work is led by Xiang Chen Ma in 2016, and he was a PhD student here at Caltech. So the mass metallicity relation is one of the most fundamental property observed in the galaxies. The existence of this relation is thought as a consequence for an interplay between star formation, gas outflow, gas accretion, and the recycling. As some examples, we know that uh, get, uh, star formation activity drives the gas metal enrichment process. And we know that the star formation efficiency tends to be lower in low mass galaxies. So it's natural for us to expect uh, low mass galaxies to be met less metal enriched. Another thing is that galactic wind can carry metal enriched gas out from the ISM. And this process will be more effective for low mass galaxies due to their shallower gravitational potential. So in conclusion, the slope, amplitude, and the redshift evolution of this mass metallicity relation is sensitive to various galaxy formation feedback processes. Due to the L-shaped parameter degeneracy that we have just seen, uh, current ALMA metallicity measurement carries very large error bars as shown by those yellow and gray crosses. So in this figure, I also show the mass metallicity relation calibrated by observation at the redshift zero and the redshift 3.5. This Selman straight line is fitted to fire simulation result at the redshift six. Uh, so we can see that due to this very large error bar, none of the mass metallicity relation in the literature are strongly favored or disfavored by the current metallicity constraint. But luckily, we have noticed that the 
critical density for the 88 and the 52 micron lines are different. So the, the luminosity ratio between those two lines is a nice gas density diagnostic. So in the second figure, I show the luminosity ratio between 88 and the 52 micron line as a function of the H2 region gas density. From here, we can see that the 52 micron line can be even more luminous than the 88 micron line if the gas density should be higher than about 100 to 1,000 per centimeter cube. So motivated by this, we have identified four ALMA targets at a, uh, at a ratio higher than six with the O352 micron line signal potentially detectable with only two hours of on-source integration time. So in the upper right, bottom left, and the bottom right figure, I show the forecasted metallicity constraint jointly by the O388 and the 52 micron line measurement. Um, those three figures correspond to uh, the high, intermediate, and the low H2 region gas density scenarios. Uh, and those correspond to high, intermediate, and the low 52 to 88 micron line luminosity ratios. From those fig three figures, we see that um, among those four targets, the MB1006, highlighted by the yellow star, contribute most in constraining the shape of mass metallicity relation at high redshift due to its relatively low stellar mass. So motivated by this, we collaborate with Ren and Inoue in Waseda University and the proposed to, uh, uh, 0352 micron signal follow-up measurement for MB1006, and the measurement was complete last year. So Ren finds that ALMA only measured three sigma upper limit for the 52 micron line signal after 12 hours of on-source integration time. So this result um, shows that the 52 micron line luminosity is pretty low. So this result is consistent with the low gas density scenario, in which case the uh, metallicity, joint metallicity constraint would prefer the mass metallicity relation predicted by fire simulation given by this Selman band. And uh, this result is also consistent with more recent JWST measurement. So during this first, uh, the first section of this talk, we have seen that we can probe nature of high redshift galaxies with their ISM emission line measurement. But we should always bear in mind that galaxies that can be resolved individually uh, are very rare sources. So basically, they serve as the tip of iceberg for the entire galaxy population. We are not sure whether the gas properties within those very bright and the rare sources are representative to the general galaxy population. So therefore, we are also not sure whether the information provided by galaxy surveys are enough for us to understand how galaxies evolve from high redshift to the cosmic noon to what we see today. So in conclusion, we have, uh, we have to somehow measure the faint and the more abundant galaxies. And this needs calls for the line intensity mapping technique. So unlike galaxy surveys that are trying to resolve individual target, line intensity mapping survey measures all the emission along the line of sight, including the contribution made by very faint sources. To better illustrate this, in this figure, I show a simulated 2.5 square degree field. Um, the galaxy distributions are shown by the gray scatters, if you can see here. And the, the very bright galaxies that can be resolved individually are highlighted by the red points. The right hand side panel shows the corresponding CO line intensity uh, fluctuation. So although both galaxy survey and the line intensity mapping survey measurement trace the large scale structure distribution, we can still immediately see the difference if we focus on the bottom left corner of this field. So we can see that in this sky area, all the galaxies are too faint to be resolved individually. So we won't see any information from the galaxy survey, but we do see signal fluctuation in the line intensity mapping survey. So this simulation only shows the 2D line intensity mapping at a specific 
redshift snapshot. The future line intensity mapping survey aims to map, map the uh, la large scale structure distributions on hundreds of subsequent frequency channels as shown by the slices of the second figure. So uh, in the data product, uh, we will not only get the target line, but other lines that we don't want to measure, and also the continuum emission given by the dust, the cosmic infrared background, and the Milky Way continuum foreground will all enter the, the measurement. Um, as an example, say if we are interested about the C2 line intensity distribution at a redshift around three, um, the CO lines emitted by galaxies at much lower redshift together with the Milky Way emission will also enter the frequency channels. So in the future, there are a lot of line intensity mapping survey planned to measure various line emissions over very different redshift ranges. And the two main questions that the intensity mappers want to answer are, first, how can we extract this uh, target signal from all those interloper line and um, uh, continuum contamination? And uh, secondly, even if we can successfully ex extract the signal, how do we connect the signal with physical properties of line emitters as well as cosmological quantities of interest. So as one possible solution for the first question, cross-correlating line intensity uh, mapping measurement with large-scale structure tracers can effectively remove uncorrelated interloper lines and the continuum contaminations. So to better explain this, let's let me still use the fiducial C2 survey as an example. So the C2 line fluctuation at a redshift around two will have non-zero correlation with large scale structures at the same redshift range, but it won't correlate with uh, CO line emitters and the Milky Way at a much lower redshift. So following this spirit, Pullen et al. in 2018 firstly proposed to cross-correlate three Planck intensity maps with two sets of large-scale structure tracers. Those are the BOSS quasar sample distributed at a redshift between 2 and 3.2, and the CMAS galaxy sample distributed at a lower uh, redshift range. So there are in total three times to two equals six sets of angular power spectrum. So in principle, all those angular power spectrum can be modeled as correlation between the cosmic infrared background and the large scale structure. So we can fit for the modeled cross section uh, result to the measurement and uh, try to probe the uh, parameters, free parameters in the CIB model. But we can show that the C2 lines emitted at a redshift around 2.6 will only show up in the cross correlation between the 545 gigahertz intensity map and the BOSS quasar. And this extra C2 intensity uh, on top of the CIB emission is characterized by a another free parameter A highlighted here. Um, so to uh, ensure simple and manage the, a simple data analysis and a model constraining process, the author in, in 2018 made several simplified assumptions about the mask of those five maps that are used to remove the very bright galactic plane as and the several point sources. So there, uh, as a result, although the authors uh, are managed to get a non-zero constraint about the C2 intensity characterized by the A parameter, and the posterior is shown by this black solid curve. But Bayesian analysis doesn't show strong preference to this for introducing this extra free parameters in the uh, angular power spectrum model. So this is not quite a signal detection. In 2019, we refined this earlier work by removing the unnecessary uh, assumptions about the mask shapes. And we also adopt more optical uh, map weighting strategies. As a result, we are able to get a more significant uh, A parameter constraint as shown by this red curve. 
And uh, this time, Bayesian analysis shows strong preference to, for introducing this parameter into the model. So if we assume that this CIB signal axis are all contributed by the C2 emission, we can combine the measurement with C2 analytic models and uh, constrain the density and the kinetic temperature for the uh, electron. So despite of all those success, we still do not claim a C2 detection in this work. This is because if the uh, frequency or say redshift dependence of our CIB model is inaccurate, the CIB residual will bias our C2 measurement. But luckily, in 2019, a work led by Eric Switzer shows that in the future, since the line intensity mapping survey will have hundreds of frequency channels, unlike Planck that only have three frequency channels, uh, we will be able to map 3D cross power spectrum instead of the 2D angular power spectrum. And the simulation shows that the CIB emission will only contaminate the lowest K parallel mode. Uh. So in the future, people can just simply remove the lowest K parallel beam to get, in order to get rid of the CIB uh, contamination bias. Uh, besides cross-correlation, there are many other uh, data analysis strategies for contamination removal and the signal extraction. So we want to uh, test various data analysis strategies over more realistic line intensity mapping mock data. And we also wish the process that we construct such a mock light cone to be physically motivated so that we can connect the simulated um, line intensity mapping observables with the underlying galaxy formation models. So to achieve this goal, we select small multi-dark Planck body simulation due to its nice balance between the uh, resolution and the simulation box size. With that, the simulation box infinitely in the x, y, z direction and then cut out a cosmological light cone covering a 2.5 square degree uh, field and extend from redshift to zero to 10. Uh, to avoid the fake uh, spatial correlation caused by this periodic boundary condition, we randomly shift, uh, reverse, and uh, rotate the bo simulation box when we stick them together. Then for each dark matter halo in the light cone, we use semi-analytic galaxy formation model developed by the Santa Cruz group to model their central and the satellite galaxies. And finally, for each galaxy, we use a submillimeter line uh, emission model called submillimeter SAM to estimate the galaxy-wide CO, C1, and C2 luminosity. So this Submillimeter SAM pipeline proposed by Gergo Popping et al. in 2019 uh, connect the SAM galaxies with numerical photo dissociated region solver, and the, its CO, C1, and the C2 luminosity forecasts are uh, have been uh, calibrated to have been collaborated. Uh, calibrated to various galaxy survey measurements at a redshift lower than six. <coughs> so uh, here I show the 3D distribution of dark matter halos within this light cone. And uh, given the information of halo galaxies and uh, the ISM emission of galaxies, we can easily simulate mock data for various future line intensity mapping surveys. F as two examples, in the right figures I show the uh, the signal, uh, mock signals for the x clam C2 survey and the COMAP CO surveys. Comparing the halo-wide star formation rate versus halo mass relation and the line luminosity versus halo mass relation given by our work and the various empirical models in the literature, we find that different models agree with each other uh, reasonably well for halo mass range between 10 to the 11.5 to 10 to the 12 solar mass. And uh, this is because there are very rich data provided by galaxy surveys to support uh, 
model calibration. However, uh, those models can be very uh, different by many orders of magnitude at lower and a higher halo mass range. And this will further lead to very important line intensity forecast since the slope and the amplitude of the line luminosity versus halo mass relation is sensitive to the underlying galaxy formation models, the future line intensity mapping survey will be able to distinguish those models and uh, provide better constraint to our understanding about how galaxies are formed. So as a natural extension of, our, of this work, we provide empirical representation for the line luminosity versus halo mass relation at a redshift lower than 10 for all the C2CO and the C1 lines covered by our model. We also provide the F duty factor as a function of uh, halo mass. So F duty factor here is defined as the fraction of star forming galaxies. The scatter of line luminosity versus halo mass relation at a different redshift and then finally, the correlation coefficient among all the lines uh, covered by this model. So with this empirical representation, one, the user can easily reproduce the line intensity and the 3D power spectrum predicted by SAM and the submillimeter SAM. So our model has been applied to various line intensity mapping interpretation and the forecast as two examples. In the left figure, I show uh, uh, our model is combined with the MIME CO measurement to constrain the uh, molecular hydrogen density as a function of redshift. And the, in the right figure uh, shows that our model is used for XCLAM C2 survey forecast. Since the line, line intensity of our model shown by this black curve, it, uh, shown by this red curve is generally lower than most of the empirical models in the literature. So our work is usually used as a pessimistic limit for line intensity mapping interpretation and forecast. So uh, at the end of the talk today, I would like to spend a little bit time to introduce my future research plan. So during this whole talk, we have been discussing that this unprecedented collection of data provided by JWST, ALMA, and the upcoming line intensity mapping survey will provide strong test for the state of the art galaxy formation models implemented in hydro simulation and the semi-analytic galaxy formation models. Although we have a lot of ISM uh, line emission models in the literature that we can use for simulation post processing, but none of the current models are very suitable for direct theory and uh, observation comparison. As some example, we have seen that the analytic ISM line emission model generally assume oversimplified ISM environment and uh, the galaxy geometry. So this issue can be partially resolved by high resolution hydro simulation for individual galaxies. Although those simulations are suitable to study particular and the individual galaxies uh, with res partially resolved ISM gas properties, but uh, those simulations cannot capture statistical properties for the entire galaxy population, which is particularly uh, important for line intensity mapping surveys. On the other hand, the large volume cosmological simulations um, cannot resolve ISM gas properties. And also due to the limited simulation volume, cosmological simulation can miss very rare and bright galaxies that are mostly uh, accessible to measurement. So to overcome all those limitations, I want to develop new ISM line emission model with a novel combination of zoom-in simulation, cosmological simulation, and the first principle model for line emission. Specifically, I want to first extend our current model to more lines covered by JWST and Spherix, including the O3 optical line, O2 line, H-alpha, and the H-beta line. Um, so this extended model can be easily combined with uh, zoom-in uh, high-resolution simulations such as FHIR and assist direct JWST and the simulation comparison. In the future, I also want to develop subgrid model for the ISM gas property based on FHIR simulation 
so and then apply this subgrid model and the extended line emission model to cosmological simulation as well as semi-analytic galaxy formation models. Why would you have Uh, you mean O2? Right, so uh, let me think. Um, so I think it will be pretty easy to extend this model to sulfur 3 because sulfur 3 only comes from the ionized okay. gas. But why, if you're developing one, why are you including sulfur? Is that a, it's, not, it's quite bright, so I'm afraid to understand. But is it, is it also bright enough for the high redshift galaxies. Uh, I, I know that at low redshift that people usually measure sulfur 2 or, or sulfur 3s, but uh, for the data set that I am focusing on in the past few years, I don't see these lines uh, observed at high redshift. But indeed, including this line into the model will be useful for like the Roman service in the near future. But I think, uh, in, in conclusion, I think it will be pretty challenging to model sulfur 2 and the C2. And uh, it will take some further work because those are coming from multiple ISM phases. So all the lines I listed here are only come from the H2 region. So because, of, because the H2 region gas property are more or less similar to each other, while if you are coming the C2 or sulfur 2 lines are coming simultaneously from H2 and the H1 region. It will be very difficult to model the transition between those two gas phase. But I think it's possible. At least I see Ferrara's group developed this very nice C2 model in multi-phase ISM. And they try to uh, compare their model prediction with cloudy. So I think with some refinement, those uh, an analytic model for C2 and the S2 is not impossible. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, okay. Yeah, so currently, uh, so yeah, basically I want to ex apply this model and the gas subgrid model to SAM and the uh, cosmological simulations to to better, uh, that will help for line intensity mapping forecast as well as the galaxy formation model development. So um, currently we have successfully extended this model to uh, most of the lines covered by JWST and the spherics to better model the volume difference between O3, O2 and the H2 region. We solve the ionization recombination balance among the hydrogen, helium, and the oxygen. So in this figure, I show the, uh, the model and the cloudy comparison for the fractional abundance of O3, O2, and O1 as a function of their, their, the radius within the H2 region. So the O3, O2, and the O1 fractional abundance are given by solid, dashed, and the dotted curves. Uh, the cloudy predictions are given by thin uh, curve, while our model predictions are given by thicker and the uh, transparent curves. So we can see here, uh, from left to the right figure, we fix everything but only vary the H2 uh, region gas density, QH1, and the effective temperature for the black body radiation uh, in incident spectrum. So we see that in all cases, our model agree pretty well with cloudy. We also compare the O3 optical line, H beta, and the O2 line luminosity as a function of QH1, comparing our model with cloudy over wide ISM parameter space, and we find this very great, uh, good agreement. So, sorry. So then, uh, I start to post-process the ISM line emission signal on the fire zoom-in simulations. Specifically, we treat each stellar particle as individual ISM emitters. Given the mass, metallicity, and the age of the stellar particle, we can estimate their stellar radiation spectrum from the stellar population synthesis code, and then to estimate the gas properties for around each star particle, we average over the nearest 32 gas neighbors around uh, each stellar population. 
So given the incident spectrum, gas property, and the, our analytic model, we can quickly post-process the ISM uh, line emission signals. So in those three plots, I show the flux distribution for O3, uh, O3 optical line, H beta, and the O2 line uh, for one uh, fire primary galaxy at redshift six. So here we can see that the O3 and the H beta line flux uh, are mostly contributed by the massive uh, and the young stellar population. But a significant fraction of O2 line is, comes from older stellar population of age uh, greater than uh, 10 uh, mega year. So this is why we can see that the flux of O2 is more extended than O3 and the H beta line. We also compared the line luminosity for among O3, O2, and the H beta line uh, for those post-process uh, uh, fire simulations and the recent JWST measurements. So the fire 20-inch twen fire primary galaxies are given by the red scatters, while the JWST measurements are shown by the green and the blue data points. So we find that our model can successfully reproduce the observed uh, O2 versus H beta line luminosity uh, as shown in the second figure. But our model under predicts the O3 optical line luminosity by a factor of about five. And uh, we think that this might be caused by in, uh, accurate gas temperature estimation given by fire simulation. So specifically fire uh, shows that the gas, uh, H2 region gas density around the young and massive star population tend to be about 10,000 Kelvin. This disagree with JWST measurement. So if we manually raise the gas temperature to 22,000 Kelvin, we will be able to successfully reproduce this observed O3 uh, optical line luminosity. So as a summary, it's a great pleasure for me to present our work here at Caltech because Caltech takes a leading stand for multiple upcoming line intensity mapping surveys, including co-map, spherics, and the time. Also, the fire group here uh, leads the development of galaxy hydrodynamic simulation and the galaxy formation model. So my research interests stand in connecting the ISM line emission measurement and the galaxy formation model. I'm interested in developing physically motivated ISM line emission models to better understand the ISM properties uh, given by the measurement and to better constrain the galaxy formation model. I'm also interested in going the other way around where we use this ISM model to post-process uh, hydrodynamic simulation or semi-analytic model to facilitate robust uh, uh, theory and the observation comparison. But in conclusion, those unprecedented efforts will allow us to fully explore the revolutionary new data set across multiple wave band and understand their implications for galaxy formation in its full cosmological context. So thank everyone for listening. From here, I will take questions. In a couple of places, like near the end, where you, uh, uh, right before you showed the comparison with the, the fire simulation, mm -hmm. you were calibrating the model against cloudy uh, in the previous slide. To yes. This. And I guess what wasn't obvious to me is sort of, uh, you know, you're calibrating and showing good agreement with cloudy. Is there something that your model is enabling you to do or to learn right. that you couldn't just do with cloudy? With yeah. Model? So there's no new physics in our model comparing with cloudy. It's strength is in its computational efficiency. So you know that to post-process ISM line emission, there are a lot of degree of freedom. So you need to uh, account for variation of temperature, gas density, metallicity, dust abundance, and the shape as well as amplitude of the incident spectrum. So there are, this is like a six dimensional or even higher lookup table 
like if you want to use Cloudy to post-process the simulation, and this will just be very expensive uh, because, because basically Cloudy solves the, the gas temperature like self-consistently through thermal equilibrium, but I feel this is not necessary, uh, not very necessary because thermal equilibrium is not necessarily true in the actual envir uh, gas environment. And the also, uh, it's, it's like if you want to use Cloudy to create such a big lookup table, it will be basically impossible. So this is why the recent season simulation, they use Cloudy lookup table to post-process ISM emission for like O388 micron line, but they always have to remove some degree of freedom, like the spectrum shape variation, which is very important for O3 and O2. So I think the strength of our model is that it don't have new physics comparing with Cloudy, but it's much faster so that you can account for more degree of freedom, and uh, which will facilitate more robust simulation and the observation comparison. Right. Because it's strong and it has a different frequency dependent. Right. And the temperature it does comes in in terms of shifting that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear to me how you can reliably model that determination. Right. So in the in our two thousand nineteen work where we cross correlate Planck with the large scale structure tracer and the try to constrain the C2 intensity, we assume that this pretty simple CIB model, which is standard given by the Planck uh, Planck measurement back in I think two thousand fifteen. So it assumes a pretty simple S E D relation with a power spectrum uh, uh, frequency dependence characterized by this beta. If that may have a very different yes. weighting, you know, based on the frequency. Right. Galaxies or high mass and low mass. Yes, this is very true. So this is why, although with this very simple CIB model, and the way detect this CIB signal axis that is very, can be C2 emission, but we didn't claim a reliable C2 detection, just because as you mentioned that the CIB model can be complicated and the SED dependence we assume here can be wrong. If that's the case, there will be some residual CIB in the angular power spectrum that can bias our C2 measurement. But as I have shown in one figure, um, simulation shows that the, the CIB, no matter how the fre its frequency dependence is, it's smooth in the, in the frequency direction, more smooth than the C2 emission line. So because of this, the smoothness in the spectrum direction, it will only show up, if we measure 3D power spectrum, it will only show up in the lowest k, k parallel mode. So basically this, this is because it's continuum emission. So one source will show up in many different adjacent frequency channels and the so the correlation on the line of sight in pretty long scale transverse to power spectrum for the low K parallel mode. So in the future, people can just remove those CIB contamination from the lowest K parallel um, uh, beam for the measurement, uh, although maybe you don't know its frequency dependence. Yeah, but it will still be smooth in the That's frequency range. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So CIB continuum is a very important source that we should consider. But uh, hopefully with the future line intensity mapping survey, with much higher frequency resolution, we can, uh, we can rel uh, like, like remove this contamination source more reliably compared with the what we do previously with the Planck map.
So just for the 88 micron line, right? Right. Right. Yes. So let me let me restate this. So if it's unclear previously, so I think your question is sort of overlapping with Philip's question. So it's like, why don't we just create a giant cloudy lookup table and uh, do linear interpolation? Is that your point? Right, but it's it's like, for example, in the in the density dimension, the gas density may extend from from maybe 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 4 per centimeter cube. So it's like for every grid, you will need to grid it pretty finely. Uh, yes, yes, in, in order to ensure reliable linear interpolation. And this is especially difficult for the incident spectrum. So the spectrum shape can vary, um, how to say, continuously. So if you can want to capture the uh, spectrum shape variation in a pretty reliable way, there will there is required to be a nicely graded two uh, three D table uh, based on the the age and the metallicity and the mass of the stars. And the adding the ISM properties is another few degree of freedom. So, so basically this will be pretty expensive. Um, and so, so having this pretty nice analytic model can strongly reduce the computational uh, source requirement. And then another strength for analytic model is that you know cloudy is usually used as a black box. So that you just throw in some incident spectrum and the ISM parameter, it will give you the line luminosity, but you don't know what's going on. But with this very simple analytic model, we highlight the most important transitions for the O3 photons and uh, highlight why some of the line ratio will be strong traces for some of the gas properties. So the physics, physical pictures will be more clear than if you use the cloudy uh, synthesis code, although that's, that's, that contains more physics than our model, but our model highlights the most important physical processes. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I don't really know why anyone doing the simulation would use cloudy. It's completely a misfit for these sorts of proof simulations. In the end, cloudy is a 1D model. Mm -hmm. it yes. Yes, yes, very, uh, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, completion. And uh, this reminds me of another factor that I should bring up. So as uh, this professor mentioned, um, like in cloudy still you are assuming a 1D model, like with uniform, maybe uniform or 1D varying gas distribution. But in the real world, the gas property should be follow some PDF, the probability distribution function. So with this analytic model, we can easily account for those, those PDF of different, uh, prime, uh, of different physical parameters. While with cloudy, it's like, it's like um, it's, it will be less flexible for those variations. Thanks to everyone.